yeah. All right, so we're going to do lecture two from chapter four, the second of three, although I do believe the third one will be the shortest of, uh, of all here. But um, so accompanying reading, so this, uh, we're going to cover sections three and four from chapter four. Section three is pages 73 through 78, but of course uh, you may have already read that. Um, as you saw that those pages were on your, your reading guide or study guide, excuse me. All right, so uh, the next little bit here that we're going to start talking about is um, what they call ecological relationships. Uh, one of the major types, and this is kind of one of those uh, cliche topics in ecology, is symbiotic relationships. Um, and so with symbiosis, again, we're, we're going to relate things back to this idea of co-evolution when species uh, have lived together, right, occupied the same ecosystem for millennia, right, uh, they tend to develop uh, these sort of relationships. Some of those are, are intimate, where one sort of relies on the other, or sometimes they rely on each other, uh, kind of depending on the circumstances, all right? Um, in some cases, uh, both species could benefit. In some cases, only one of the species benefits. And there's sort of different names we give for those types of relationships. Uh, but again, it's this result of this evolution that's occurred side by side. Because again, evolution doesn't really occur in isolation. All evolution is co-evolution. All right? So the three major types, right? If you guys did like an internet search for types of symbiosis, you'd come up with these obscure kinds. We're just going to stick to the three biggies, all right? Number one is mutualism. Number two is commensalism. And number three is parasitism. And again, these will kind of illustrate how I was just mentioning, um, you know, where sometimes they both benefit, like with the case with mutualism. And with commensalism and parasitism, only one benefits. And I, whoops. And I will differentiate between those two terms here shortly once I kind of show you some examples, okay? Um, so with mutualism, the idea is it's a symbiotic relationship in which both members benefit, all right? So the most common, so again, that cliche example is bees and flowers, right? So the bees help the flowers spread their pollen, right, which helps the flowers to thrive and uh, crossbreed keep their genetic diversity up, whereas the bees get a little food in the form of nectar from the flowers, so they both benefit. There's your mutualism. Uh, the book gives a cool, um, less known example, which is uh, what they call uh, mycorrhizal fungi, okay, uh, and plant roots, all right, in particular certain species of trees. And so the mycorrhizal fungi uh, grow around and into the roots right there in the soil right alongside the tree. Um, by the way, sometimes fungus can be a bad thing to have, but this particular type of fungus is really good at um, fixing nitrogen, all right, which is a, an important, uh, I guess, uh, nutrient for plants, all right? Um, and so those mycorrhizal fungi actually bring nitrogen from the air, right, and fix it, and we'll talk about what nitrogen fixation is in the next chapter, but fix it for the trees. And so that's basically, uh, they create a little fertilizer for the tree. Now, at the same time, um, the roots provide fungi with food. So even though the fungi are actually feeding on uh, some of the root particles and fragments of the tree, the fact that they bring in the nitrogen for the tree uh, causes both the tree and the fungus to thrive in that relationship. And so we call that a mutualistic relationship because both species benefit. All right. Commensalism, remember, is one of those relationships where really only one benefits. Um, but in the case of commensalism, one benefits, the other is neither harmed nor helps. The other is more or less unaffected by that relationship. Um, so, again, the, the example that the book gives is epiphytes and tropical trees. All right. So epiphytes are uh, similar to like a fern. And what they'll do is they'll anchor themselves to a tree. Uh, maybe up on the, the trunk, the base of the tree somewhere. Uh, and what they'll do is they'll anchor themselves above the forest floor. All right? Um, and what they do is they help give themselves a little bit more sunlight that way. And so the, the fern or the epiphyte itself benefits because it gets greater sunlight by anchoring itself to the tree, which brings it above the floor a little bit. 
The tree, however, really isn't affected. The epiphyte isn't uh, robbing the tree of nutrients or anything like a parasite would, right? So it's on the tree, but solely for the, the purpose of getting some extra sunlight, okay? Um, but because the epiphyte doesn't take any nutrients from the tree, nor does it really help the tree in any way, uh, we call that a commensalistic relationship or commensalism. All right, and then the third type, and as the name might imply, uh, generally we don't uh, refer to parasites as good things, right? So parasitism is where one of the two species in that relationship is a parasite, all right? Uh, so one species is benefited and the other is harmed by that relationship. Uh, although it is worth stating that parasites rarely actually kill their host, right? Uh, because it actually wouldn't help that species out. Like if I have a host and I'm using that host to, to get nutrients or whatever, I don't really want that host to die. I want that host to stay alive. But uh, you are robbing the host of nutrients. So uh, there are countless parasites out there. Um, and again, if we're going to stick with the, the book given example, we've got the Varroa mites and honeybees. Uh, interestingly, there's a, a big decline in bee populations. These actually did sort of help, uh, harm the reproductive capability of the bees. So it's kind of an exception to that rule. But anyways, there's a big decline in our honeybee species. In fact, we're still still a little worried about those, those guys. But um, they, they actually, they were kind of baffled or dumbfounded by what was causing it. I think there was even a uh, hypothesis out there that the cell phone signals was thrown off the bees' navigation and the cell phones that were causing the decline in honeybees. And it turned out it's actually these little mites that get into the, the lungs. They're tiny, tiny little mites that actually get into the lung sacs of the bees and uh, we're weakening them and making them less uh, less able to kind of cope with other stresses in the environment. So anyways, uh, so the, the mites in this case benefit, whereas the honeybees are harmed. That's why we call that parasitism. All right? So symbiotic relationships are relationships in where at least one of the species in that relationship relies on the other species. Sometimes they both benefit, sometimes one benefits and one is unaffected, and sometimes one benefits and one is uh, harmed, but usually not killed by the relationship. All right? Now, predation is not necessarily a symbiotic relationship. So uh, I'm not going to be giving you guys any new information here. I'm pretty sure you know what a predator-prey relationship is, right? It's where one species eats another. Now, technically, uh, herbivores are predators on the plants, okay? Uh, we don't often think of them that way, but it's just the consumption of one species by another, all right? Uh, so uh, most common predator-prey interaction is either pursuit or ambush, all right? Uh, and plants and animals, though, because of this co-evolutionary process, have actually established some defenses against predation through evolution. And we'll go through some of those examples as well. All right. So in pursuit and ambush, right, uh, pursuing just means chasing it down and catching it, right? So this picture here, the day gecko and the spider, the gecko just kind of chases that spider down and uses this sticky tongue to, to slather it in, right? Uh, ambush would be something more like maybe what a spider does. Uh, maybe sets a trap or stays hidden and, and jumps out and catches its prey. Uh, in some cases, they'll, they'll attract their prey with uh, bright colors or light. Uh, so you guys have all probably seen Finding Nemo. You've got that angler fish down in the deep, deep part there. It's got the light that glows that, that attracts prey. All right. Uh, plant defenses. So plants, obviously, they can't run away. So speed and agility and stuff like that really aren't going to be in uh, uh, the defense category for plants. Um, so what they've done is they've developed spikes, thorns, leathery, leathery weeds, or thick wax, um, sometimes poisons that make them unpalatable. All right. Uh, animal defenses, of course, faster they are. So speed and agility. Uh, in the case of porcupines or turtles, they have what they call mechanical defenses. So they're uh, like a hard shell of the turtle or the spines that uh, can do some damage to their predator, right? Uh, one of the most common defenses is just living in herds. So for our, our mammal species like um, elk and water buffalo, stuff like that, 
uh, camouflage, uh, chemical defenses, so like our poison dart frog over here, right? Uh, the skin secretes a pretty nasty toxin, and most predators have uh, sort of learned that the bright coloring of that frog is a warning that it's actually poisonous. And interestingly, some amphibians that aren't poisonous have mimicked that bright color so that they look like they're poisonous, even though they're really not. That's what they call uh, uh, mimicry in the biological world. All right. So um, competition now. So we talked about some of the, the adaptations for uh, predation, right? When something's trying to eat you, right? There's these mechanical defenses, chemical defenses, speed and agility and camouflage. Now, some relationships aren't about one organism trying to eat the other one. Some relationships are about competition, all right? Uh, and so within the world of competition, it's uh, when you've got two different species, or sometimes the same species actually, depends on what type of competition we're talking about, uh, they're trying to get the same resource, all right? So it could be the same food, they want the same living space, and there's just not room for the two of them, all right? Uh, and so in that, that case, we, we have a, uh, the resulting competition for that resource, all right? Uh, and the two types of competition we'll talk about are intraspecific, um, that'd be between individuals uh, in a population. Remember, a population is a group of the same species, right? Uh, and so that could be like two, uh, two elk, you know, uh, duking it out for a female or something like that. They both want to attract a mate, so they're going to fight each other, right? Uh, Interspecific would be two different species um, competing for a similar resource. So maybe you've got... You go out your grass, right? You've got competition between your grass and probably some clover, probably some dandelions trying to sneak their way in there, probably some other species of grass like crabgrass or Bermuda grass out there. They're all competing with each other for the nutrients in that soil and for space and even for some of that water. And so because they're different species, we call that interspecific. All right. So, uh, book gives a pretty cool example of interspecific competition between two different species of paramecium. So we've got uh, P. aurelia and P. caudatum, right? And so these graphs here show the two species uh, in a growth medium without competition. So uh, they both show you know a nice little growth curve and then a settling out at their carrying capacity, right? Uh, now, if we were to put both of them into the same um, uh, growth medium, right? Because they're both similar and need sort of the same thing, so they're going to start competing with each other. And in the case of these two, if we put them in the same uh, growth medium, we see that the P. aurelia is a little bit more fit uh, than the paramecium caudatum, and it outcompetes, right? So essentially what happens is that caudatum is, is nudged out of that ecosystem by the P. aurelia. Uh, because of that competition that the Aurelia wins. All right, which leads us into uh, a pretty another another pretty well, uh, fundamental term in ecology, which is what they call the ecological niche. Now, some people say niche. Uh, I think that sounds weird. All right, uh, so I'm going to say niche, but if you say niche. I won't judge you too harshly, okay? Um, lots of people say niche, so anyways. Uh, now, uh, a niche, an ecological niche, is referring to the basically everything that an organism does or needs or uses uh, within its ecosystem. So how much space does it take up? What types of nutrients does it need? Uh, either from the soil as a plant or from, uh, from other organisms if it's a, if it's a consumer. Okay, uh, all of those things describe that organism's niche. All right, um, takes into account everything that an organism is and does and needs and wants within its ecosystem. Right, physical, chemical, and biological factors needed to survive their habitat with sort of abiotic components. Uh, does it need and use all those things to describe the niche? So it's pretty. It's a pretty broad term, really. Okay, uh, so what happens 
right, when the niche of two different organisms overlap, right? Going back to that idea of competition, right? Uh, so in the case of the, the two paramecium populations we talked about, we showed the graph of the two paramecium separate all by themselves, right? Uh, and so without competition present, what we would focus on is what I call the fundamental niche of that organism, right? So potentially how big could that population get? How much space could it take up? How many resources could it use? That's what we call that fundamental niche, right? Now, with most things, though, we do run into some other species within the same ecosystem that need at least some of the same resources. And so anytime those niches overlap, right, we get some competition. And as a result, most species don't achieve their fundamental niche. They achieve what's called the realized niche, right? So we've got some environmental resistance in place in the form of competition, uh, et cetera, all right? And so it's really the actual niche of the organism is the, the realized niche, okay? Uh, and so we have these two anole lizards. We've got the green anole and the brown anole. Now, they do differ in some important ways, one of which is the, the coloring, right? Uh, but because they are both um, similar, they're probably going to have some similar uh, overlap in their niche, right? And so when that happens, they'll be where that overlap occurs at least, that's where we'll see some competition, all right? And so in the case of the green anole and brown anole, Right, the fundamental niches overlapped, right? So as we see in the first diagram, right? And so in this space of overlap is where we're going to have competition now. In this particular case, the competition results in, right, species two, the brown anole, uh, nudging species one, the green anole, out of that overlapped area. And so that would be an example, another example of that competitive exclusion that we talked about. Now, since though, in this case, species one does differ slightly in its niche, its realized niche is just a little different. So uh, in some cases, overlap of niche and uh, competition can actually result in um, pushing one species out to a different niche, all right? Uh, and so luckily, the green anole has some adaptations that allow it to occupy a niche that's different from the brown anole. So Brian and always out, able to outcompete it. All right. Uh, so uh, there's a this is actually a pretty big topic right here when we talk about limiting resources. Um, and so this graph is just sort of an idealized graph, and a limiting factor is just anything in the environment that's going to put uh, limits on how big a population could get. Okay, um, and it, it's browse. Broad. So competition for resources is one of those is a limiting factor. Disease, space, the amount of water, the pH of the soil, the nutrients available in the soil, uh, the, uh, the, the the soil type, right? All these things are limiting factors. All right, and different species are adapted for different amounts of different limiting factors. So, uh, for example, let's say my limiting factor in this case is, say, rainfall, right? So, what we have uh, in rainfall, we could range in rainfall from, you know, very harsh desert conditions to, you know, your lush tropical rainforest conditions. Now, there is an optimal amount of rainfall for different plants, right? So, some plants require lots and lots of water and rain. Right? And so their optimum level would be somewhere way over there, whereas some plants uh, require very little water, and their optimum level may be way over here. All right? Uh, so uh, let's talk trees, for example. All right? So right here in the U.S., uh, we have a variety of trees. Some are adapted to uh, so, uh, needing lots of rain. Some are adapted to uh, being able to survive, you know, hot, dry summers and stuff like that. So. Uh, let's take coastal redwoods, for example. Coastal redwoods are actually uh, trees that live up in northern California, even through southern Oregon, on the wet side of those states. So on the windward side where they get lots and lots of rain, that's where we see those coastal redwoods, right? Um, and so their optimum level might be, you know, way up here, right? And then we don't see a whole lot of coastal redwoods growing on the dry side of the mountains, right? 
Uh, and so as we start going down this direction toward the uh, less rainfall, right, we end up with too little of that resource, right? And so we don't really see any coastal redwoods existing down here. Now, uh, let's take another tree, like the tree that was really common where I grew up in western Washington was a Douglas fir. Now, Douglas fir don't require as much rain as a coastal redwood, uh, but they're really common still in western Washington. Not as much in the rainforest part of western Washington, but in the part where I grew up where we still get plenty of rain, right? And so the, the Douglas fir might have its optimum here on this one that's already shown right and so we have some overlap so it wouldn't be too unrealistic to find some dug fir growing alongside some coastal redwoods in a natural ecosystem right because there is some overlap where both of them uh, can survive pretty well now if we come over to our side of the state over here in walla walla uh, you know there's lots of planted trees in walla walla but if you go up mill creek for example uh, actually here in the valley we're a little little too dry for most a lot of tree species particularly evergreens but if you go up mill creek a little bit uh, where we pick up a little bit more rainfall we start seeing a bunch of uh, pines uh, either lodgepole or ponderosa all right and so the lodgepole or ponderosa pine its optimum level of rainfall is probably a little bit less than the dug fir but maybe significantly less than the redwood right and so we're definitely it's actually more common going to see some overlap of dug fir and like ponderosa pine but not very often are we going to see an overlap where we're seeing both coastal redwood and the ponderosas growing side by side all right so uh competitive exclusion versus resource partitioning uh, in competitive exclusion remember one out competes the other one right and it could completely outcompete it or just nudge it to a different niche whereas resource partitioning is a case where um, because of maybe some intensive competition uh, we have similar species that end up altering their niche a little bit and so in the case of these warbler species look they're all could potentially occupy the same forest and even potentially the same tree all right but notice where the Cape May warbler occupies compared to the yellow rump warbler, for example, right? They, they have adapted a different uh, method for dealing with that competition. So they want to reduce competition, right, in some way. And that can happen through exclusion, but it can also happen through this resource partitioning where they decide, not decide, nature uh, is able to partition that resource out. And they occupy just a very slightly different niche which reduces that competition a little bit, okay? Uh, and so it's kind of an interesting uh, result of competition where the one doesn't necessarily outcompete the other, they just all change a little bit over time, and that reduces the competition. All right, uh, that is the end of lecture two. We will have some material next time you come to class to help review these ideas and think a little deeper about them, all right? Uh, I'll talk to you later.